Hello, comrades. Uh, this is Carl Wood um, with the National Economics Commission of the CPUSA uh, tonight or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, we're presenting on political economy of modern capitalism. And uh, I'm going to uh, just say a, a few words of background before launching into the, uh, the formal presentation. Um, most of us know Karl Marx. Uh, uh, as a scholar and a political leader in a lot of different dimensions. Uh, he was trained as a philosopher, a uh, student of philosophy at least, uh, but in fact he spent uh, a great deal of his life digging into economics, the economics of, uh, of capitalism in particular. And uh, I think everybody knows that his magnum opus is really the central work of his uh, intellectual career was Capital, uh, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, which form the basis uh, of our understanding uh, as communists, as Marxists, of how political economy works, of how the economy of capitalism, as well as other economic systems work. And we're going to be digging into the mechanics of modern capitalism. The, the name of this class is the Political Economy of Modern Capitalism. Um, just tell you a word or two about my background. Um, I'm an old guy. I'm 74 years old, uh, and I've spent most of my working life uh, as an industrial worker and as a union. I've been a union member practically all of my uh, working life, and I've worked in the steel industry, the utility industry, and been both a rank-and-file union activist as well as a local and uh, national leader. Uh, of, a, of a union. So uh, I approach some of these things, or all of these things, I think, from the practical point of view of how does it affect working people. And that's informed not only by my study of the Marxist classics and other works, but also my own personal experience on the job in the industries where I've worked. So let's move on. Um, first of all, what is capitalism? Capitalism is a historically evolved stage of human society. I think uh, most of us are familiar with the commonplace knowledge about uh, human society having evolved and developed through uh, various stages from a very early humanity, which lived in a tribal situation, not a class society, through stages of, of uh, slavery, of feudalism, and uh, capitalism. Um, the ca capitalism is, is characterized by, first of all, a concentration of wealth in the hands of a few people who own the means of production. The great majority of the population has no means of getting their living except by selling their power to work for wages. Marx called this class of propertyless workers the proletariat. Today we call it the working class. Virtually all production under capitalism is for exchange. That means uh, things are produced for sale on the market, not for the personal use or the family use of the producers. And goods produced for exchange are called commodities. This is a key term that we're going to get into. It's one of the underpinnings of understanding capitalist economics. So what is a commodity? Marx wrote that the wealth of those societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails presents itself as, quote, immense accumulation of commodities, end quote, its unit being a single commodity. So really, in order to understand capitalism, for starters, we have to understand what a commodity is. And Marx helped us with that by identifying three qualities that every commodity has. First of all, it's useful. It has what he called a use value. That is, it must satisfy some human want. Uh, second, it's a product of human labor. So that, uh, for example, uh, a, a diamond that's buried deep in the earth uh, is not a commodity until it's worked on by human labor. In other words, until somebody digs it up, out. Uh, third, it's produced for exchange. That is, uh, if something is just produced for domestic use, 
by the worker or the worker's family, uh, that doesn't make it a commodity. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, a peasant farmer who uh, raises crops and uses those crops to feed their family uh, is not producing commodities. They only become commodities if they are produced for the purpose of bringing them to market and selling them for exchange. Ultimately, the exchange value, uh, Marx simply called this value, of a commodity is determined by the socially necessary labor time required for its production. Uh, that's, that's an important term, socially necessary labor time. What that refers to, uh, I think we all know that different workers have different levels of efficiency and diligence. Uh, not everybody works at the same speed, not everybody works with the same skill and effectiveness. Um, I, I'm personally an electrician, a maintenance electrician, and frankly, I'm not the fastest guy on the team. Um, but uh, there are other people who are slower than I am, and there are some who are faster than I am. So when we talk about the socially necessary labor time, we're talking about the average time uh, that's required for the production of a commodity. Long before the emergence of modern capitalism, merchant capitalists, uh, if you want to think about who they might, they might be, I think everybody has heard of Marco Polo, who was an Italian merchant who traveled to, uh, to China and bought products there, spices and, and textiles and so forth, and brought them back to Italy and other parts of Europe and then sold them for more money than he had bought them for. Um, so they're not, he wasn't involved in the production process. He made his pro profits by buying and selling commodities, often transporting them from areas of abundance. Uh, silk uh, goods, for example, were uh, relatively abundant where they were produced in China to areas of scarcity, like Italy, where they didn't have silkworms, where they didn't have uh, the wherewithal to make silk fa fabrics. And that's how the Marco Polos of the world made their profits. Um, some of the merchant capitalists were on the side, they were pirates. Uh, so they made some of the profits just by stealing from other people. Um, and that, that tradition continues in modern capitalism. But under capitalism, under modern capitalism, new value is created in the process of production, not through exchange not by buying low and selling high, but rather by producing new goods and services from commodities that are purchased for the purpose of production. Marx uh, described the production cycle under capitalism uh, by this formula that's showing on the screen. The capitalist starts with money. That's the first M in the line. With that money, the capitalist buys commodities necessary for production. Those commodities might include raw materials, equipment, machinery, land, buildings. Um, and uh, those, uh, those commodities are called constant capital because by themselves, they can't create a new commodity with a value greater than their own value. Um, for example, uh, take the steel industry, which I'm fairly familiar with. If a capitalist starts out with a pile of iron ore and a pile of coal and uh, some limestone and uh, the machinery that's needed and so forth, all of those things are necessary for production, but they're not sufficient because if uh, without the uh, a special ingredient, they'll just sit there and uh, will not result in any greater value. In fact, over time, they'll lose value because uh, the machinery will rust, the uh, other materials may wash away in the rains. But the crucial extra commodity is called labor power or variable capital, which we represent by a small v. And so, uh, when we combine all these into this process, we start with money, we buy the commodities, both the constant capital uh, commodities and the variable capital, that is uh, the wages to pay the workers. 
it goes into a production process. And out of that production process, we come out with a new uh, commodity or set of commodities. And uh, so all those raw materials I was describing uh, go into a steel mill. The steel mill produces uh, steel, uh, sheet metal or rods or bars or uh, whatever form the steel takes. And that is then sold for money, which if the whole process works out right for the capitalist, is a greater sum of money, frequently a, a considerably greater sum, sum of money than what the capitalist started with. The employer hires worker workers, and that's another way of saying, or we have another way of saying it, the employer buys labor power. Doesn't buy the labor itself. Uh, the employer could hire me and just have me sit around until I'm needed. And uh, the employer is not buying my labor because I'm not performing any labor, but it's buying my time and my availability to do labor when directed by the employer. And that's why we make a distinction between labor and labor power. But the employer hires workers, uh, buys labor power, and the labor that they add to the production process is what creates new value. However, the pay that workers receive for their labor power is only a fraction of the new value created by their labor. The rest of the newly created value goes to a number of different categories. Um, we all know about owner's profits, and that's really as far as a lot of people understand about how capitalism works, is that the owner makes an investment and buys materials and the labor power and then makes a profit. And we all know about that part of it. But other parts of this additional labor, uh, additional value that's created, uh, go into other categories. For example, commercial costs such as advertising sales commissions, political lobbying, all of those necessary for this process of capitalist production because the stuff has to be, uh, has to be sold uh, in order for the capitalist to make a profit. And all of these are necessary components of going from raw materials and through production to finally the sale of the end product. Uh, some of the excess value goes to excessive compensation to top management. Um, in recent years, in recent decades actually, uh, the level of excessive compensation to top management, in other words, CEO salaries, uh, has become scandalous. And uh, I, I think anybody who picks up a newspaper sees the headlines about the compensation that top officers of, co of corporations get. And while it's not a new development that top management gets paid very well, uh, what is a new development is the when we see uh, CEOs of companies making uh, many millions of dollars per year uh, as, co as compensation, something that couldn't possibly reflect any real uh, contribution that they make to the production process. Part of uh, the surplus value also goes to pay interest on bonds, on bank loans, uh, any way that the, uh, the company that is engaged in the production uh, borrows money in order to use it for uh, financing the production process. And then there are other uh, categories that sort of generically we refer to as rents, but they include uh, rent itself. Um, if, uh, if buildings and land are rented by the capitalist in order to facilitate production, but also licenses and patent fees. All of these in themselves are, do not contribute to the production process, but they result in, uh, in somebody making money and that money comes out of the total surplus value. So together, all of these are called surplus value. Uh, which we rep represent by the letter small s. In most U.S. industries, total surplus value is at least three or four times total wages. In other words, even though labor produces all value, workers only receive 25% or less of what they produce. So why do businesses claim that their rates of profit are so much lower than 75 or 80%? 
Um, you know, every time there's a grocery strike or the threat of a grocery strike, the grocers claim that their profit rate is only 2%. And uh, I'm not going to go into how they arrive at that. But there are two reasons that, in general, why these numbers don't correspond. First, uh, they only include part of the surplus value. That is the owner's or the shareholder's profits in the equation. The boss uh, cries poverty when they get into wage negotiations because the shareholders are only receiving, say, 10% rate of profits. But actually, the banks, the landlords, the bondholders, the corporate officers, they're also getting rich from the value added by the workers' labor. In contrast, Marxists use the following formula to, to describe the rate of profit. That is, uh, the rate of profit equals the surplus value uh, divided by the variable value. Uh, in other words, the total uh, excess uh, over the cost of production um, divided by the, uh, the amount that goes to wages and worker compensation and then uh, turn that into a percentage. And what you come up with uh, is, um, is, is something called the rate of surplus value. And that's much more useful for actually understanding uh, the dynamics of capitalism, because we're looking not at the rate of profit, which of course is con of concern to the capitalists, but the rate of sur surplus value, which can also be called the rate of exploitation. Uh, the rate of exploitation or the rate of surplus value is the surplus value. Uh, that is the extra value that is added through the production process divided by the portion that goes to the workers or the variable capital turned into a percentage. And so in Marxist terms, uh, exploitation is not just a quality uh, or a form of oppression, but it's also quantitative. It can be measured. Um, I'm sure that we've heard uh, people say, uh, I only make $13 an hour and I'm exploited, but you make uh, $27 an hour, so you're not exploited. Um, that's, a, uh, th that's perhaps a qualitative view of exploitation, but it doesn't reflect the Marxist analysis. The Marxist analysis is that if you get paid less than what you produce, then you're being exploited. And this formula also expresses uh, the degree of exploitation under capitalism. Now, bourgeois economists never use the rate of surplus value formulation, but as a practical matter, capitalists perfectly well understand its importance. In his book, Super Profits and Crises, uh, the late communist economist, Victor Perlow, quoted ads by state governments in business journals uh, that weren't read by too many workers. Uh, I, I've included a couple of these quotes here. One, uh, profit, uh, th this is out of a, uh, an ad placed by the state of New Jersey in a business journal. And they said, profit from, uh, profit from the highest workers' productivity of any industrialized state in America. Value added per dollar of wages is a hefty $3.76. That's 376 per dollar of wages uh, versus the national average of 336. That's the only measure of labor cost that matters. What really matters is how much value was added to your raw materials or component parts by those workers during the manufacturing process. Um, that, that's an awfully Marxist statement to be coming from the state of New Jersey, but there it is, and it was published. This uh, was published sometime back in the 1970s. Actually, the numbers have changed since that time, and they've changed in the direction that moves against the interest of workers, not the other way. Um, uh, around the same time, uh, not to be outdone, New York placed an ad saying that New York's manufacturing workers produce $4.25 in value added for every dollar of wages. So there you have it, coming from the official representatives of the ruling class, acknowledging that uh, capitalists get three or four dollars uh, for every, uh, uh, 
profits and, and related excess uh, um, amounts uh, for every dollar that the workers end up with. And that's what we understand as exploitation. In his book, uh, The Unstable Economy uh, from 1973, um, the same economist, Victor Perlow, calculated the rate of exploitation in the U.S. in the post-World War II period using official U.S. government statistics. Um, I just picked a couple of, uh, of lines. He, he has a year-by-year -year, um, uh, accounting in the graph in the book, but uh, I didn't have room on the slide. It wouldn't have been readable. So uh, what we look, can look at here, though, is starting right after World War II, 1946, the rate of exploitation adjust and all these are adjusted for inflation uh was a little over 70 for 75 percent the next uh, couple of years later five years later it was up to 89.5 percent and you can see from the chart um it kept going up and up and up by 1969 it was 129 percent um i used perlow's methodology uh, that he described in the book and some U.S. government statistics that I found online and calculated that recent levels of exploitation exceed 240%. Um, I'm not going to go into the reasons that the 240% doesn't correspond exactly with the 350% or the 400% that we were looking at in the previous slides. Uh, there can be some difference in methodology and, uh, and frankly, I'm not a professional economist and didn't have the wherewithal to break it down. But I think even 240% rate of exploitation is, I think, to all of us, uh, it's outrageous because what it represents is the robbery from the working class of the fruits of their labor. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to ask people to uh, offer any questions and comments that you might have up until now. Um, I've gone through this a little faster than I anticipated, so maybe I can spend a little bit more time responding to questions and comments. And so I'll ask Dee if she will uh, open up for uh, receiving some of those. Okay, the floor is now open for comments and questions. Okay, Cindy. Hi, Carl, thank you very much for this so such a clear lecture, but my question is, so somebody has to pay for these rents, these licenses, these bonds, these whatever, whatever, whatever. So I'm, so I'm just like pushing back. How do you call it surplus value when it has to be paid for in order for the commodity to get to market? Thanks. Okay. I, I'm, I'm going to try to take all the questions first and then I'll go through because there may be duplication and maybe I can put them in some kind of logical order. Matthew, your mic is open. Hi, my name is Matthew. Um, he, him. Thank you so, so much again, Carl, for the presentation. Um, I just had a question about the MCP formula or MCM based on the transliterations of it. Um, what in a in a potential socialist or communist um organized economy what would this formula look like then in that case would it still be very similar except state run or would there be a different way to like invest in the economy invest in how jobs are organized in the first place thank you thank you molly your mic is open Yes, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Wood, for this excellent breakdown. Um, and I did want to echo the first question that did come to mind, too. Um, maybe a, a, an answer to that is that, like, who decides that these licenses cost money and these patents cost money? The capitalists. So it's just another form of expropriating, um, you know, a wealth that's not theirs. But um, my question was uh, about, like, what do you, how do you respond to somebody who says, but like the capitalists are so brilliant and oh my God, 
like we can't you know have anything happen without them telling us you know how brilliant they are and we need them to be you know you know it's just like when i think about the the ceo of amazon you know he went to all this education and all this stuff so that's one of the things that they like to portray themselves as being worth this type of this type of money thanks okay Giles, your mic is open. Okay, so it seems like in order to try to, to know what the real value of our work and labor is, you're gonna have to first find out about company finances. And in these days, they tend to keep that secret and hidden away from workers. Is there a way we could know about company finances without getting in trouble? Thank you. Okay, if, um, I think I can take these uh, questions in order. Uh, first of all, Cindy's question. Um, uh, doesn't somebody have to pay for uh, rent and, and all these other outlays that are not labor expenses? And certainly they have to be, that has to come from somewhere. Uh, the question is, uh, first of all, um, are capitalists the only one that can provide that? And as we know from the experience in socialist countries, uh, they're not. And uh, the uh, society as a whole, uh, organized uh, in the preliminary stages of socialism, um, can, uh, can provide the financing for various industries. And uh, there are different approaches to that. Uh, one uh, approach was used in the Soviet Union. In other uh, socialist countries, um, there have been kind of mixed approaches were which mix both public and private financing uh, during the initial stages of socialism but i think the key thing is what happens to the uh to the uh surplus value the the amount of value that's created beyond what the workers are paid because unlike uh anarchists for example um or anarcho syndicalists uh, Marxists do not believe that 100% uh, of wor what is produced automatically goes back to the workers at that particular enterprise. There, uh, uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, um, one of them being that certain industries would then result in enormous amounts going to the workers, uh, and others would result in very tiny amounts going to the workers. And there has to be some sort of uh, leveling process in which the fruits of labor are distributed in an equitable manner throughout the working class. And, uh, and there are other reasons as well that I'm, it's not really uh, the time to go into that right now. Um, but the key thing is that if, uh, if these investments are made uh, by society as a whole, uh, in other words, if they're made by the state acting on behalf of the working class, then the uh, then the surplus value that is created goes back to society as a whole, not to a small fraction of society represented by the moneyed class or by the capitalist class. And uh, I, I think that's the key thing here um, is, uh, sure, there has to be investment in order to make uh, production happen. And that's true in every society, but it's a question of what happens to the produce of that, the products of that production. Um, with regard to uh, Matthew's question, the cycle of production formula, let's go back to that. What would that look like under socialism? Well, in a lot of respects, it would be uh, fairly similar. Um, you have to start with some capital. Uh, or, or the uh, the materials and the uh, uh, the the constant capital that's necessary for production, and you have to start with workers, and the workers have to be paid wages, and production takes place, and there would be new commodities that are produced. Uh, in terms of uh, what the commodities are sold for, they obviously have greater value than the commodities that were started with because the labor has added its magic to the process. And so there is greater value uh, than was started with. 
and the difference really uh, comes down to what happens with the new value that's created. And I just uh, tried to describe that um, in response to Cindy's question. Uh, some of it will uh, go back to uh, society as a whole, a lot of it will, um, to pay for all sorts of things that are needed by society. One is just uh, the continuation of the production process. Another is the expansion of the, uh, of the machinery and the other components of, uh, of constant capital uh, in order to facilitate greater production going forward, if that's what society desires. And um, it may also include uh, increasing uh, social benefits, uh, universal high quality medical care, for example. Um, and I, I won't, uh, universal uh, uh, free education at all levels from preschool through, uh, through graduate school and beyond. And these can all be financed uh, by society as a whole uh, in, its, in its role as uh, the operator of the economy as a whole. Under capitalism, uh, financing these socially necessary things uh, is pretty problematic. And it's, as we all know, it's incredibly inequitable and uh, it's very inefficient. Lots of people don't get educated. Lots of people don't get decent health care. Um, and uh, so, but the production formula itself, I think, remains pretty similar. Let's see, Molly asked, uh, who decides um, what rents and so forth? Let's see, I, I, I didn't write down the question very well, but part of the question was, what do capitalists do to justify their earnings? Well, I guess the question is what they do and what they say. Uh, they claim um, somebody like uh, Elon Musk, for example, claims uh, ownership of the concept of electric vehicles. Um, uh, that, that's ludicrous. That's, that's absurd. Uh, his contribution to the process uh, was um, organizing the production and uh, he's not the first person in the world to do something like that. You know, Henry Ford is uh, widely given credit for the development and invention of uh, the production assembly line for automobiles. And uh, that certainly was helpful and was quite a contribution. And, uh, and arguably uh, the inventor of that process uh, deserves some kind of compensation. Whether that compensation, whether a realistic compensation, equitable compensation for that is to make somebody a multi-billionaire or nowadays, uh, you know, who knows what the limit on those billions of dollars is, uh, I, I think is, is kind of absurd. The, the reason that these people get these enormous amounts of money from what they do is because uh, they are sitting on a monopoly over some industrial process and as a result they are able to extract extreme profits from the labor of other people and um and uh i, I think another thing to keep in mind here uh is it's kind of axiomatic uh, and lenin asserted it uh that uh capitalism does play an important role in developing the material preconditions necessary for socialism. Uh, modern industry, frankly, is organized, except for uh, in terms of who gets the, uh, the dividends, but uh, it's otherwise organized uh, in a manner that will be used by the socialist society that, uh, that succeeds capitalism. And uh, Lenin said that uh, imperialism, modern capitalism, uh, creates the material preconditions for socialism. And that's certainly true. Uh, you couldn't have socialism, uh, not modern socialism, without assembly lines. Uh, I think that um, Amazon, for all of its uh, sins and shortcomings, uh, made a great contribution uh, in developing the distribution technology that will be used under socialism. And that, however, does not uh, merit allowing someone to uh, 
uh, sees billions and billions and billions of dollars making themselves the richest person or the second richest person in the world uh, off the labor of other people because it's the workers in those Amazon warehouses, it's the delivery truck drivers, um, it's the other people that work there who are actually creating the value. Uh, the value is not entirely created by the development of the process. The development of the process is part of it, but it's certainly not the bulk of the labor that goes into the process. It's one small portion of it. And so uh, maybe Jeff Bezos uh, deserves um, a pretty decent salary, um, more than a truck driver gets. Um, not a million times more or a hundred million times more. Um, anyway, uh, th that's how I'd respond to that. Uh, and then Giles asked, how do you know about company finances? Um, I don't have a snappy answer to that uh, with um, publicly held corporations, the things that are listed on the stock market, for example. Uh, there are lots of legal requirements that they disclose a lot of their internal uh, workings and internal finances, although not all of it. And, uh, and they are constantly trying to cover up what they're doing and uh, among other things to evade taxes, uh, but also to prevent the public from understanding what's going on. And I think that short of uh, moving to socialism, there are things that could be done uh, through legislation to force the entire, the complete disclosure of uh, the internal business workings of private enterprises. Um, I don't expect that to happen under the current administration or the next one, but uh, I think it's possible to move in that direction with mass pressure. And one example of this, uh, I, uh, I have, I come out of the utility industry uh, as well as the steel industry and actually served a term as a state public utilities commissioner. And the state public service commissions and public utilities commissions were uh, created uh, beginning back in the 1880s uh, as a result of a mass movement to force the railroads to disclose the workings of their, uh, of their finances because they were squeezing uh, the farmers uh, out of uh, almost all of their profit uh, because of the monopoly that they held on the means of transporting farm goods to market. And so these uh, commissions in almost every state were set up in order to force the railroad monopolies to disclose what their actual costs were. And certainly something like that could be done. It, that doesn't bring us socialism, just as we don't have socialism in the utility industry today. But we do have a, a greater level of transparency uh, with publicly regulated utilities than we have for other privately owned enterprises. So with that, um, let's move on to the rest of the slide presentation. And uh, I'll... Um, proceed from there. There will be another opportunity for questions and answers at the end. And uh, so if you have any that occurred to you while we were having this discussion, uh, please write them down right now and then we'll take those in uh, when we get on to the next portion. What we're going into now um, is not just the, uh, the mechanism of basic capitalism which, uh, and those mechanisms in a lot of respects haven't changed a whole lot since Marx's time. Um, but uh, we're going to go into some characteristics of, uh, of capitalism, which have gotten a lot more attention in the 20th and 21st century, uh, although some of these certainly were present uh, during Marx's time and, and were addressed by him to some degree. Uh, First of all, uh, is the concept of extra profits. And we're gonna go into what we mean by that. Uh, sometimes we say super profits uh, instead of extra profits. But um, as, as we all know, I think, racism has been associated with capitalism since its beginnings, especially in the United States. Uh, the United States, in a lot of respects, it was, of course, uh, built on the expropriation of the uh, of the territory itself from the indigenous peoples that lived here, the Native American Indians, 
um, who were subjected not only to uh, the expropriation of their lands, but also to forms of genocide being uh, um, wiped out uh, uh, entire populations in many cases. Um, but in addition to that, uh, with the development, with the uh, uh, development of European domination of the New World, uh, after Columbus, the uh, very quickly on the heels of that uh, began the slave trade from Africa, and a large portion of the population of the continent of Africa uh, was uh, virtually exterminated in the course of capturing people, trading people to be slaves in the New World. Uh, they were kidnapped. They were uh, transported to the coasts and uh, and transported under unspeakably, almost unimaginably horrible conditions to the new world and where they were forced to work on plantations and engage in, uh, uh, in production. Um, and this was coincided uh, with the very beginnings of modern capitalism. And so the forms that slavery took, slavery wasn't new. Slavery has existed uh, in other forms of society for uh, millennia. But it took on a particularly uh, brutal and, um, and systematized, systematic form under capitalism. Uh, in addition, uh, sexism, as we know, has been deeply embedded in every class-based human society, including capitalism. And under capitalism, super exploitation, that is the extra profits from discrimination against racially oppressed groups, against immigrants and women, uh, means that these workers are paid less than the value of their labor power, uh, to say nothing of the value they produce by their labor. And what we mean by uh, the value of their labor power, the value of their labor power is what it costs to produce that labor power. In other words, what it costs to uh, feed, clothe, house uh, the worker and, uh, and allow them to uh, reproduce uh, the, uh, the working class. Um, so uh, that is to support their families. And people, groups of people, who are subjected to this extra profiteering are not even receiving uh, the bare value, the bare minimum value of their labor power. That is the minimum that's needed in order to reproduce that labor power. Um, so uh, some people think that uh, groups of workers that are not racially or sex uh, or oppressed for uh, racial or uh, immigration status or uh, gender, uh, that these are paid more than uh, what they're worth. In fact, uh, what's happening is that other groups of people are paid less than what they're, they're, the value of their labor power. According again to Victor Perlow, domestic super profits, that means these extra profits uh, that result from wage and income differentials due to racism, uh, totaled $150 billion in 1984. Um, I, don't have, uh, I don't have recent figures, although there are economists who have calculated these things. I, I just don't have the numbers close at hand. But it's today many, many times more than $150 billion uh, that was uh, the case in 1984. Uh, combined with the super exploitation of workers in other countries, because uh, workers in outside of the United States, uh, in what we agree, we sometimes call third world countries, but less developed countries, um, particularly in Latin America, in Asia, and uh, in uh, in Africa, um, the profits uh, th th those workers are pretty consistently paid less than the actual value of their labor power. Um, and combined, uh, uh, combined this super exploitation of workers in those countries, uh, the profits from racism uh, accounted for about one third of the total property income in the United States in 1984.
again, according to Perlow. Now, as, as I hinted at before, the chief source of extra profits uh, in discriminate, uh, is discriminatory wage differentials. Um, that doesn't mean paying white male workers more than the value of their labor, because white male workers, uh, in any case, still get paid significantly less than the value of their labor, but by paying other workers even less than the white male workers are getting. Um, additionally, these specially oppressed groups lose income because of unemployment. Uh, unemployment rates are higher among these groups of people. Uh, employment in occupations that do not directly contribute to profits. Um, and uh, here I wish we had a live audience because I'd like to draw people out about uh, what those occupations are, but I'll give you some hints. Um, uh, uh, housekeeping uh, in married or uh, married couples, um, child care, child rearing, all of those things uh, within the family uh, typically do not result in any kind of payment, and yet they're necessary for the production process. So uh, that means that uh, those people are denied a proportionate share of surplus value. Um, extra profits, though, are not the only purpose of racism and sexism. They're used to prevent the unity of the working class. And I, I think every day when we pick up the newspaper, when we listen to the TV or radio or go online and look at the news, we see examples of that, how racism and sexism are used to uh, prevent the working class from acting as one in its own interest. Uh, these attacks on sections of the working class facilitate a broad anti-labor offensive by capital. So as long as the powers that be can, uh, can keep us focused on uh, the necessary fight to protect a woman's right to choose, for example, or keep us focused on uh, uh, red herrings about, um, about crime and, uh, and personal safety uh, in cases where there isn't any justification for that, uh, they misdirect our attention away from who is actually conducting the exploitation of working class people. Um, and an assault against the working class as a whole, um, that is attempts to, uh, successful attempts to block unionization of workers, for example, uh, it hits with exceptional severity the specially oppressed sectors of the working class. Um, what about unemployment? Uh, actually, we're, we're living in a very unusual time right now because uh, unemployment, uh, while it still exists and among certain groups of the population, is still very significant. Um, uh, it, it's at a fairly low level historically, um, but in general, as we look over a uh, historical period, not just a snapshot of a particular moment, as the productivity of labor grows under capitalism, more goods and services are produced by fewer and fewer workers. Um, the, the system just becomes highly productive, and this leads to the creation of what Marx termed the Industrial Reserve Army, which is a permanent, although varying in size and makeup, uh, it's a permanent feature of the capitalist economy. For the capitalist, this reserve army of unemployed provides multiple benefits. It means that in times of prosperity, there's a pool of additional workers, uh, for people who have been on the unemployed rolls, uh, now they're available. Uh, to come into the workforce and expand production and along with that expand profits. And then crucially in times of recession or depression, it enables the capitalists to cut wages and recoup dwindling profits. It enables the capitalists to lay people off and, uh, and to put further pressure on the working class, both uh, through um, cutting back hours, cutting back wages, and forcing people to work longer and harder hours. Uh, 
Um, let's look for a moment at uh, who the capitalist class is today. Uh, in any period, uh, the capitalists are a class of persons possessed of wealth in money form and owning the means of production, which are set to work by hiring wage workers. Uh, that's a quote out of one of the books that I'm going to recommend to you um, by uh, a British economist named Eaton. Um, but uh, that, that's a simple definition of what a capitalist, uh, what the cl capitalist class is. They're, they're people with money uh, who own the means of production and they use that money and they use the ownership of the means of production to, uh, and they hire wage workers and that's how production takes place. Uh, so the question uh, that some people ask is, how large is the US capitalist class? And in a moment, I'm gonna show you some slides that, uh, that explain with a little more precision, uh, I think, but I think at most it's around 1% of the U.S. population. And here we're talking about people who, not just who are rich, but who have enough wealth that they are able to live uh, without, uh, without having to work. And I mean, they can work if they want to, but they don't have to. They can make sufficient money from their investments, from their ownership, uh, in order to uh, live at a uh, a fairly decent level, and um, and we'll look at that in a moment. And uh, we ask the question: How is wealth distributed within the U.S. capitalist class? Um, there is, as we will see, an extreme concentration near the top. This is from a study that was. Uh, done, uh, or a paper that was published actually, in October of 2014 by two economists, uh, both of whom now are at UC Berkeley. Uh, one of them, uh, uh, Gabriel Zuckman, uh, is a French economist who studied under Thomas Piketty, who people may re uh, recognize that name from the work that he published a few years back, uh, describing the extreme concentration of wealth in the capitalist world today. Uh, but Zuckman was at that time with uh, the London School of Economics. So these are not fringe economists. The, they come from very mainstream, uh, very, very mainstream institutions. And I'm going to go to a chart here, which I hope you can see fairly clearly. And what this shows, uh, I'll call your attention in particular to the blue and the red lines uh, near the bottom of the graph. This uh, shows the share of wealth uh, concentrated in the top one-tenth of one percent of the population over a period of time. So uh, if we look at the blue line, for example, and here we're looking at the top um, one hundredth of a percent to a tenth of a percent. Um, and going from about 1960, it's about seven uh, uh, seven percent. Um, and in 2014, it's up around uh, 11 percent. So, so it goes from seven to 11, which is a very significant increase over that period of time. Uh, looking at the red line, we go from a little, and that is the top one hundredth of one percent. So we're talking a very small portion of the total uh, population of rich people in the United States. Um, it goes from about a little over three percent in 1960 to something around 11 percent or an increase of almost four times. Uh, in just that period of time from 1960 to 2014. So what we have is not only a, uh, a pretty significant stratification of wealth in the United States, but an acceleration of that process of stratification. Um, in other words, the rich get richer. And that process of the rich getting richer has accelerated in, uh, in the last number of years. 
And I'm going to go to one more slide here. What, uh, there's a lot going on in this slide, and I don't expect people to absorb all of it. But let's look at the, the top section of it where it says top wealth groups. And, um, and it gives a number of families. So the full population here is 160 million uh, families. And uh, then it gives a number of families in each of the, uh, the subgroups. And then the wealth threshold for defining, uh, like what is the top 10%, that means you have at least $660,000. And uh, the top 1%, at least $3,960,000. And uh, what I'd like you to think about is how much wealth would you need in order, I mean, any of us would be happy to have $660,000. Uh, I think we feel that we were pretty well off if we had that. Maybe some people have that much um, who are on this call. It's not inconceivable because part of the wealth that's included here is the value of your, uh, of your house minus whatever is owed on the mortgage. And so if you have a house that's worth uh, uh, a million dollars and you owe half a million, then your wealth is $500,000. Um, that doesn't, I think, in any way make you rich, although you're certainly better off than if you're a renter or if you're homeless. Um, but frankly, look at the people in that top 10%. Uh, the richest of them uh, have a wealth of three and a half or two and a half million dollars. Um, it's actually as much as we would all like to have two and a half million dollars, um, you're not likely to be able to live on that uh, without uh, depleting the amount of your wealth over a period of time. Uh, probably in order to have enough money to live on uh, from the income of your investments, you have to be in that top 1% group. In other words, uh, about 4 million up to about 14 million. And so I use that as kind of a, a cut, cutting point or a, a dividing point between who are capitalists, in other words, people who are able to live off of income from their investment and people who still have to some degree or another uh, have to work for a living. And so I think that means that the capitalist class in the United States uh, probably includes people uh, in about the top 1% of wealth. Um, nevertheless, uh, those aren't the richest people in the country. Um, when we look at the top hundredth of 1%, uh, now we're talking about serious big money. We're talking about people from uh, $100 million up to almost $400 million. And of course, um, and this is back in 2012, which wasn't all that long ago, it was 10 years ago. But today, uh, look at the super fortunes of the billionaires that we know about, that we just read about in the newspapers, and they're way beyond this. So this gives you some idea of the distribution of wealth uh, among the capitalist class uh, and among the rest of the population. And I think, uh, so when we talk about uh, the slogan that was used about the 1%, the 1% really does refer to the size of the capitalist class, but it also in some ways misrepresents the level of extreme concentration of wealth because the bulk of the wealth in this country is not concentrated in the 1%, it's concentrated in the 10th of 1% or the 100th of 1%. So with that, I'll go back to our slideshow. So that kind of raises the question, um, do different sectors of the capitalist class behave differently? Well, I mean, what different sectors of the capitalist class are there? Obviously, one way of dividing them up is uh, just in terms of sheer wealth. Uh, there's a difference between a capitalist who owns maybe three or four local grocery stores and which may be worth some millions of dollars, $10 million maybe and hires hundreds of workers. Um, but their net worth is not uh, enormous compared to Jeff Bezos or uh, uh, 
or some of the other billionaires, now hundreds and hundreds of billionaires that exist in the United States today. Uh, in addition to that, different sections of the U.S. capitalist class represent different industries and economic interests. Um, certainly the behavior and interests of capitalists in the, uh, in the retail sector, for example, um, are different from those in the armaments sector. Uh, there's different levels of concentration of capital. Uh, some parts of the uh, capitalist class are relatively small capitalists and are faced with, uh, as a practical matter, they face quite a bit of competition. Um, on the other hand, you have sections of the capitalist class that face almost no competition. And, uh, you know, I mean, look, look at, uh, there, there are, uh, even in the very large sectors, uh, there is competition that takes place. Even a company like Amazon uh, has to contend with uh, companies like Walmart, like um, Target, and other large, uh, extremely large retailers uh, that are of comparable size. Some of these don't get a lot of publicity, and others make the news more frequently frequently because they're they're newer and so they're more newsworthy and sometimes just because their approach to public relations is different. Um, there are also differences within the uh, within the capitalist class of uh, different historical experiences. For example, some industries have historically a high level of unionization um, until uh, until the last two decades, for example, the steel industry was largely unionized, um, today much less so. Uh, today, the uh, utility industry, I think, is probably the highest uh, rate of unionization of any private sector industry. But you have other industries where there is, uh, and tragically, this has become the majority, the large majority, there is practically no level of unionization. Much of the retail sector, for example, um, and uh, I, I think you know all of us can probably stop and think about sectors that we're aware of where unions practically are non-existent. Uh, there's also difference from industry to industry and from region to region in the intensity of racial discrimination, the intensity of sex discrimination. Uh, those are things that exist everywhere in capitalist society, but the intensity of them uh, is, uh, is different from place to place and from industry to industry. And then they have different relationships to foreign uh, military and trade policies. Um, obviously, the armaments industry has a lot of interest in military policy and in foreign policy. Um, they, uh, there's a great deal of enthusiasm uh, with parts of the uh, parts of the ruling class for participation in the war in Ukraine. And part of that is simply it's an opportunity to make a lot of profit out of selling military materials. Um, additionally, um, this is something we forget about sometimes, and I'm not sure if it's the most important factor, but uh, because of the extreme concentrations of wealth at the top, the personal preferences of individual big capitalists can affect their political behavior. And, uh, you know, we see that going on right now with Elon Musk and his uh, attitude towards um, uh, what he considers free speech uh, in uh, digital media. And um, that, that's become a big, big news item. But even historically, there's, there's quite a range. And I think, uh, sometimes we can get a little distracted. Uh, you know, they say uh, you can't see the forest for the trees. And sometimes there will be individual capitalists whose behavior is not typical for their class. Uh, one fairly extreme example I can think of, um, uh, in the last century, uh, Armand Hammer was the chairman of the board, the CEO of uh, Occidental Petroleum. And he was one of the wealthiest people in the world. And, uh, but he was also, uh, the way he got his name, Armand Hammer, uh, his father was a socialist and named him after the symbol of the Socialist Workers Party. 
which is a uh, which was the uh, main uh, left-wing socialist party at the end of the 19th century, and their symbol was a uh, worker's arm holding a hammer. And Hammer was, uh, you know, I, I don't know the story of how he came to own Occidental Petroleum, but he did, and he became one of the wealthiest people in the world. Um, but he also uh, was uh, sympathetic in a lot of ways to uh, socialism and became known as Lenin's favorite capitalist. Uh, he was kind of unique though. Um, the more typical capitalists were people like Henry Ford. Uh, Henry Ford uh, was a ruthless, uh, well he, he was on the one hand, he was, he was a pretty uh, brilliant organizer of, in his industry. Of, uh, he helped to develop and commercialize the uh, the assembly line, but he also uh, was savagely anti-labor. And when attempts were made to unionize his factories, uh, he called out his private uh, police force and workers were murdered in the course of those, uh, those struggles. And um, so he was certainly in no way sympathetic. And yet at the same time, uh, he was, uh, when the Soviet Union uh, was, became open to some foreign trade under the Roosevelt administration, uh, Ford was happy to find opportunities to, uh, to sell uh, technology to the new Soviet Union because he could make a profit out of it. Uh, but Ford was also a vicious anti-Semite. Uh, he spent a lot of money and a lot of his energy in popularizing anti-Jewish uh, uh, tropes and, uh, and was a supporter of uh, the Nazi uh, regime and its anti-Semitic uh, anti policies. Um, and we can go on and look at individual capitalists and we find these peculiarities with each one of them. Um, we find some that are more libertarian and we find some that are uh, more fascistically inclined. Um, but at the bottom of it, uh, all capitalists uh, are will do what they can in order to preserve and expand the system of capitalism, which at its core involves the exploitation of work workers and the domination of the political system by uh, the small group of capitalists uh, that dominate the economy. Different sections of the ruling class of the capitalist class um, have, as I said, they have different approaches and opinions about uh, foreign policy, about military policy, about trade policies. Some of the companies are dependent more upon the exploitation of workers in other countries and are interested in exporting uh, capital and jobs to uh, to other countries where the labor costs are lower. And others may have an interest in keeping, um, uh, keeping some of the production at home for various reasons. Um, and as I said, because of these extreme concentrations of wealth at the top, uh, these personal idiosyncrasies of individual capitalists can affect their political behavior, but um, in general, it doesn't change the nature of what class they represent and whether it's a liberal capitalist or, or a Donald Trump or, a, uh, uh, or an Elon Musk. Let's talk for a minute um, about fascism and Sadly, we're at a moment in history when we have to be very concerned about that. And so it's worth taking a look at who the fascist oriented capitalists are and why they're so inclined. Um, Georgi Dimitrov, who was uh, a Bulgarian communist who uh, headed the Communist International in the 1930s, defined, made the classic definition of fascism. It's the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary, most chauvinistic, and most imperialist set elements of finance capital. Now, different sections of the capitalist class have different interests, and hence they have different agendas, as I was just going through. Uh, in general, those engaged in the extractive industries, such as oil and gas and mining, 
uh, the armaments industry and the export of capital to less developed countries tend towards fascism. It serves their desires and needs better than, uh, than liberal democracy. But for much of the capitalist class, liberal democracy, as long as it has strong protections for property rights, provides a more favorable business and social climate. Um, that is a uh, climate not just to make better profits, but also uh, these folks have to live in society uh, to some extent. And uh, frankly, a liberal democracy is a more pleasant environment than living under a fascist regime, even if you're part of the fascist class. So uh, there is a preference in normal times for the continuation of a liberal democracy but when push comes to shove, if their property rights, uh, if their class domination is threatened, uh, even these liberals tend towards fascism. So that's the end of the presentation that I'm going to make. Um, I, I just I didn't want to include an extensive reading list. Uh, this is maybe a starting point. Um, uh, the the third thing here uh, of two pamphlets by Karl Marx, Wage, Labor, and Capital, and Value, Price, and Profit, are published in a single volume by international publishers. And uh, they're sort of fundamental. Uh, the, the challenge with them is that the language, since they were written in the mid-1800s, the language is somewhat archaic, and uh, the examples may be a little inaccessible to people who live today. But they're worth going back to and referring to, because this is really what defines uh, what classical Marxism is about. Um, John Eaton uh, was a British economist who wrote this book, Political Economy, as a textbook for teaching workers in Britain. So it was written uh, in English uh, in, the 18, or in the 1950s. The language is modern. Uh, the, ex the examples, of course, it doesn't keep up with the economy because a lot has changed since the 1950s. But, um, it's much more, I think, readable and accessible, and I strongly recommend it. Again, it's available through international publishers. Um, I've made a number of references to Victor Perlow here. Uh, he's written a couple of books, but uh, this is one of them. Um, it seems to be out of print, as best as I can tell, uh, although you can still find copies if you go online looking at used booksellers. Um, and maybe International will reissue it if it haven't already. And then in order to understand modern capitalism in the 20th and 21st centuries, I think you have to look at Lenin's book on imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. So uh, that's a suggested starting reading list. And uh, I, I think if you decide that this is a, an area that is of great interest to you, you can go on from here. And now I will hand it over to Dee to collect questions and comments from folks. Okay, we'll open the floor again for questions and comments. Thank you. A uh, very quick, quick question. What is the commodity that is sold in the, that generates so much profit in the Wall Street? We don't know the, uh, what, what, is the, what, is the, what is the commodity they're producing that you know, the, the billions of dollars have been generated in the in, in income in the, Wall Street, in the financial sector. Repeat your question, Mushin, please. Question is, what is the commodity that produces so much profit in the financial sector? Michael Madden, do you want to speak? Well, yes, thank you, Dee, and thank you, uh, Carl, for demystifying this whole process. Um, I just had an observation, going back to your previous um, comments, that if we were to take <clears throat> a breakdown of how it is um, that the Starbucks and particularly um, Google and um, Apple and the, the fellow who manufactures uh, the cars and um, Amazon, in other words, right, we're on the thrust thr in the middle of an organ a successful organizing drive, part one. Imagine it was commonly known, oh my God, the prices that we pay, you know, we, everyone is getting ripped off. So Carl, if the possibility that we could apply the uh, surplus value, and this might be a study three months down the road to, well, how Google is throttling the entire planet um, 
this would be something that um, many people could put their hands around. And thank you once again, Carl, for this very easy to understand working class point of view on um, political economy. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Dee. Thank you, Michael. Shay, your mic is open. Yeah, I just wanted to add a comment for uh, folks that usually get out left out in this particular kind of topic. Um, disabled people are like legally required to be unemployed and they can only have up to $2,000 in assets and they're not allowed to be married. Uh, and unemployment rates for disabled people who are not on disability, for example, like autistic people, reach as high as 87%. Uh, and that's concerning too with our social policies regarding this concerning because of uh, COVID having somewhere in between 10 and 30% disabling rate. Uh, so I just wanted to put that out there for people, for people to remember, um, you know, about groups that get exploited a lot, disabled people uh, get left out and they bear like a massive brunt of, of, of all this. Thank you, Shay. Susan, your mic is open. Hi, so we have uh, like eight comrades here. So asking a question from someone. Um, so what do we mean when we assert that all surplus value is created at the point of production? Um, so how do we define the point of production? Lowell, your mic is open, Lowell. Thank you, Dee. Aloha, Carl. Thank you for this presentation. Um, my question is, how do we bridge this gap um, of the knowledge that you're sharing today and the working class? Um, I love Shaw. I, I've read Shaw all of my adult life, and he's often saying if workers only knew, if people only knew X, Y, or Z, there'd be a revolution in two weeks. Um, I think workers instinctively know the things you're talking about, even though they may not be able to articulate as well as you are articulating what you are talking about. How do we get this knowledge base transferred from where we're speaking today to the broader working class? That's my question, thank you. Thank you. All right, Carl, you have the mic. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to answer these in order. Um, and some of the questions, I, I'm not sure that I fully understood them, so I'll try to respond as best that I can um, based on what I understood them to be. Uh, the first question was about a commodity that uh, produces so much uh, profit in the financial sector. And maybe that question goes to why is the financial sector so fabulously profitable? Um, and, and I think the answer in general is that the uh, uh, financial center, uh, it doesn't deal with other commodities, it deals with money, and uh, which is sort of the, the uh, essential, com or the, it, it's the commodity that defines uh, the value or the, the, um, the market value of other commodities. And in that sense, it has a lot of leverage. Um, and I think for that reason, uh, banks and venture capitalists and anybody else who controls a lot of capital has a lot of leverage over other sections of the uh, of the capitalist class. And you know, there's no honor among thieves, and these folks are willing to uh, rip each other off uh, just as much as ripping off the working class. And if they have the ability to do that if a venture capitalist can get richer by uh, sticking it to uh, other capitalists, they're perfectly happy to do that and le uh, let the other capitalists do the dirty work of exploiting the workers. They'll just uh, skim off the cream from the other capitalists. So I I'm not sure if that was a question, but I that's the best that I can come up with uh, as an answer. Um, and uh, the question about how Google is um, affecting the entire uh, economy. Um, again, I'm not sure that I really understood that question very well. Um, so uh, I, I'm not going to try to answer it because I'll probably end up responding to the wrong thing. 
I, I do want to respond to Shay, Shay's comments about the uh, policies with respect to the disabled. Um, there, I, I think this is a real example uh, of some of the profound inhumanity of the capitalist system because uh, it, uh, it, it, it illustrates the failure of capitalism in the first place to allow for the full development of the human potential of certain groups of people. And uh, in the first place, uh, perhaps, um, people with disabilities. And uh, there, uh, it, it reflects the organization of capitalist society in which the focus is not on developing people to their full potential. The focus is on squeezing as much labor power out of them for the least amount of money. And um, that's a completely inverted or perverted uh, set of values and priorities. In a socialist society, uh, there will be uh, provisions for uh, allowing every individual to develop to the full extent of their uh, potential. And also to guarantee that because people are born or, or things happen to them that enable, that, uh, that disable them in some way or another and make it possible for them not to be fully competitive uh, in the economic sphere, that they're not punished for that and that they're allowed to live full and fulfilling lives uh, without regard to uh, what, what nature or society may have dealt out to them. Um, the uh, question about what is meant by all surplus value is created at the point of production. Um, what that goes to is uh, that uh, there, you know, I think people who are used to capitalism and sort of accept its premises uh, think that, that value is created when you take some capital, take some money and put it in a bank account um, and miraculously after a year uh, where you had uh, $100, now there's $104. And somehow those uh, dollar bills conjugate and they uh, engage in reproduction and, and miraculously or through a biological process, new value is created. That isn't where new value is created. New value is created through the production process itself. And that means, and the place in the production process is not the purchase of the raw materials. It's not the purchase of the labor power. It's not the renting of the physical uh, buildings and land and so forth that are necessary for the production. It's at the point where production actually takes place. And that is, uh, is hidden from, uh, from general view, but it is exactly what is going on within the capitalist e economy. And that's why we focus on the point of production. Um, it's not the only place that surplus value ends up. Uh, obviously, uh, it ends up in a lot of different places. Uh, and I went through that in an earlier slide where we, just, we saw some of the different hands that get placed on the surplus value that's created. But in terms of where it is produced, uh, it happens at the point of production. And then finally, you know, the, uh, the big question is how do we carry this to the working class? Uh, if I had a real simple answer to that, somebody else would have had it a while ago and we'd have socialism already. Um, so that's something we all have to work to discover. But what I have observed, and I think what communists generally have observed and experienced, is that working people become receptive to these ideas uh, in the course of their struggles. I think that, for example, the workers who are uh, trying to organize themselves at Amazon, the ones who successfully won a, an NLRB election in Staten Island recently, uh, they've learned a lot. And they've learned some of these lessons that we're talking about today. Under In normal times and other circumstances, they wouldn't have learned those things. Um, sometimes it takes being involved in a struggle to open up your mind and to open yourself up to different possibilities. And it isn't only direct economic struggles. Uh, if we look at the uh, experiences of the civil rights movement, for example, 
um, people who are involved in that, uh, even at the leadership level, people like Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, learned a lot about how the economic system works, um, that things that they perhaps didn't understand going into it. And certainly that was true of uh, a lot of the rank and file people who were involved in that movement. Uh, the peace movement uh, is a tremendous learning arena for, uh, for people. So anyway, the time has expired, I think, for this, uh, this class, and I don't want to drum on beyond that time. So thank you all for your participation and attendance, and I hope that people got something out of this presentation. Thank you.